How y'all doing? I realize this is the last keynote. So a lot of y'all are in between whether or not you want to be here, you want to start drinking or smoking or doing something else magical in this town. But I'm going to try my best to give you 20 minutes that will hopefully share some of the insights that I've learned over the years, uh, both as an entrepreneur and as an investor. Actually, just to get things started, it'd be helpful to know how many of you all are Redditors, just by a show of hands. It's okay, don't feel bad. Hey, all right, thank you. Upvotes for all of you. Upvote, 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 upvote. Uh, thank you. Uh, started that 13 years ago right out of college. Uh, it's pretty amazing to consider how far it's come. Uh, and I actually applaud all of you all for your bravery, for being willing to admit to this room full of people just how unproductive you are because you spend so much time on the platform. Uh, you're not alone, though. 340 million people every month are clicking those upvotes and those downvotes and have produced a ton of data uh, that helps us better understand how to enforce our policies as well as how to provide content that you're going to want to open up your Reddit app for every single day. But this isn't a talk about Reddit, spoiler. Uh, hopefully you got to hear a couple of my colleagues, Dr. Chris Slow and Nick Caldwell earlier today talk about it. None of you. Okay. Well, watch the video, all right? What's so remarkable is what a great job that they've done. Um, I stepped away from the company day to day at the start of this year, uh, moved back to the board in order to be a full-time investor. Um, but the last three and a half years have been phenomenal. Um, we've, we've, we've taken the company from about 50 employees, not really shipping a ton of code, to nearly 400. And uh, I'm, I'm so proud of the fact that you know, the reason the whole thing works is because of users like you. Um, but I want to talk about David versus Goliath. And I know it's cliche. I had an alternative title that was like speedboats versus aircraft carriers that my buddy Gary came up with. But whatever the analogy is, one of the things that has me so excited to be doing early stage investing now is the fact that there has been a huge shift just in the last two or three years that we've seen early stage startups take advantage of. And two of the areas that have influenced us the most in the last two years have been crypto and machine learning and AI. Now, Historically, these are buzzwords you put on slides in order to trick naive investors. For years, we just saw them just like shoved into a deck. Don't worry, we're going to use AI for that. We'd ask why. They'd say, I don't know. <laughs> I just thought it was cool. I thought it would be a way to get money. Uh, but what's really changed in the last few years is that there is now a shift of really talented people solving pretty impressive problems at scale and sharing the models and the frameworks with which they're, where they're doing that. And so we're seeing startups taking advantage of it, and hopefully a few of you here are going to do the same. How many of you actually are startup founders? Okay, good mix. And the rest of you presumably are just waiting to start your startup. Is that right? Okay. So this is an, this is a, an essentially very special time. Um, you know, back in 2012, we heard the pitch for Coinbase, and we're one of the first seed investors. Um, we've seen crypto evolve, and we are excited by it, but the actual full potential of something in the world of AI and machine learning as a startup actually can potentially rival what crypto in a decentralized web can provide. I, I think there are some amazing changes that are happening, and like I said, in the last few years, we've seen David's startups show up with the ability to actually compete and beat incumbent large big tech companies. Now, I know the attitudes in Europe are actually a lot more forward thinking and progressive when it comes to things like privacy rights and the size and influence that companies wield. But when I talk about the big tech giants, right, we're talking about Amazon, we're talking about Google in particular in this AI ML space. And it's fascinating because they're actually producing a lot of the frameworks that we as startups and startup founders are able to build upon. And it's this wild dynamic because it's in their best interest, right? They want to ultimately get more customers for their cloud services. They want to find more competitive advantages to show how they're different from one another. But for the Davids, for the startups, it means you can take that relentless focus that only a startup can have and actually apply it towards solving really real problems. And the data, it turns out, is the bigger challenge, how to get that data set that's big enough to actually drive that value. And we've seen more and more startups taking this approach, which is actually rather brilliant in its simplicity, uh, which is finding ways to get people to pay them for the privilege of data collection. For an early stage startup, you don't have much, right? You've got an idea, 
hopefully you've got a basic understanding of calculus, and so you've probably messed around a little bit in AI and, and done some machine learning work. Um, but the bar is actually much lower. Incidentally, much lower than what it takes to do cryptography, right? That's definitely next level. Um, so there's, a, there's an air of accessibility to it that makes this also really ripe for innovation. It means that with some hard work and some focus, you can actually build something that is like actually good enough. And we see these improvements, right, that are like a percent or two better, and everyone says, I'm not really sure why it works, but it does, and so that's good. <laughs> and that's actually good enough. That's actually how we're making progress and improving our models. And so we've seen startups, this is one in particular, standard cognition, that has benefited tremendously from how much Amazon has terrified the retail industry with Amazon Go, with one demo. Remember that demo, right? Susan walks into the store, picks uh, some popcorn off the shelf, goes and walks right out, doesn't have to go to the checkout. Amazon Go immediately upended how retail thought about their future because they realized Amazon was coming to their space and they had no means whatsoever to compete. And so the Fortune 1000 of American companies are now realizing they're sitting oftentimes on a ton of data, often pretty disparate, and not able to make sense, let alone build on top of any of it. And so this creates an opportunity for founders, for founders like these, for founders like you all, to make them your customers. Because what they are realizing is an existential fear for how their business is gonna get done. Meanwhile, the, the algorithms, the software, the improvements that even some just plucky founders with minimal funding can make are meaningful enough. The hardware it takes to actually do this is, is off the shelf pretty cheap, right? Hardware prices continue to push towards zero thanks to manufacturing efficiencies. And by using that off-the-shelf hardware, compared to what we had even five or 10 years ago, and then the fact that most gaming PCs, <laughs> those computers can now sit in these stores and do real-time image recognition and do these actual processes is pretty powerful, right? As those numbers continue to trend towards zero, it's gonna be the companies that are able to collect as much data to train as intelligently and thoughtfully as possible to make their software as good as possible that will be selling to the very customers who today are making their service better. And this is an interesting thing. So many startups struggle to even find that first customer. And what we've seen in just the last few years, and this isn't just in the Valley, in fact, most of their initial customers are worldwide and in Asia. Um, what we've seen in the Valley is a crop of startups springing up with some interesting tools on the software side that are able to prove like actually prove out a success that is better than whatever the industry average is. They let us look under the hood, you look at the algo, you see that there's something real there. You're still not entirely sure how it all works, but you're confident enough that this is better than the industry average. It, you, you actually have a product to sell. And where so many startups get stymied, spending time iterating for years before they get anything to their customers, you have to get to them as soon as possible. The new world here, where data is so valuable, actually further incentivizes you as a startup founder to get those first customers because they won't just be paying you to keep the lights on, they'll be paying you to improve the product itself. And this is a big deal. And we're seeing rapid, rapid growth in an industry that is just dying for innovation because none of these retailers are ever gonna do it themselves. And this doesn't stop there. Um, autonomous vehicles, I mean, this was a research project when we talked about it five years ago. Um, a company started by Kyle Vogt uh, was an MIT dropout who had done autonomous vehicles like a decade earlier in college. He came to us with a pitch to start Cruise. And he said, I'm gonna do a self-driving car company and I'm gonna compete with Google. And we said, good luck. <laughs> good luck, probably don't have a chance. Uh, turns out we were very wrong, but we were happy to be wrong. Kyle and Cruz were acquired by General Motors for a billion dollars and really kicked off this startup surge of autonomous vehicle companies, and now there's dozens of them. And they're all competing in various different ways. In Voyage's case, they figured they would be as agnostic as possible when it came to hardware and just optimize for the software and getting that data into place as soon as possible. So they found retirement communities were actually really happy to have autonomous vehicles, and their roads looked just like any other roads, except they were private. And so you could get the training data, you could get people to pay to give you the training data, and you'd have a controlled, safe environment to actually do these tests in a way that was making the service better, and also actually getting real people to benefit from the service. Uh, in this case, retirement communities were a really nice touch, because a lot of these people don't have mobility that they used to have. That one woman here, she's legally blind. 
Uh, it is a threat to her life to get behind the wheel of a car if she's the one driving it. Uh, but now she's got mobility. Um, this is a different world than what we saw in startups 10 years ago. It would have been years, 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 and lots of money before any of these companies would have been able to get their first customers. But now, because the costs have precipitously fallen the last few years, the tools and the techniques have been expanded upon, there is a real culture, an amazing culture, of almost an academic and academia-like style of sharing progress. As, as researchers move from academia to the private sector and then back to the private sector, so much of the knowledge that is created is not bottled up, it's actually shared and published because it's in everyone's best interests. And we're seeing this Cambrian explosion in the same way that, frankly, I benefited from when we were starting Reddit in 2005. Because all of the software that we needed to actually start our web server and actually start our startup was open source. And all of the things that created Web 2.0 bloomed from that spring of open source software. And we're seeing a similar inertia and a similar energy. The difference is now, there's also a ton of data, a ton of it. And I know this is a very sensitive subject, and it's an important one that I think is starting to get more coverage. One of the things that we're hoping is that platforms like Paperspace are gonna be able to prove to be one more way to compete with even the Googles and the Amazons of the world when it comes to where you're doing the work of your ML and AI. Uh, and this is all just a feature war at this point, right? It's who can do it faster and better and cheaper. But we think this trend is going to continue. We are very long on this continuing. So much so that we think of all those Fortune 1000 CEOs. And this was me doing a Google image search for old white guy CEO giving thumbs up. Turns out there were a lot of results. This one was my favorite. But this guy, who often runs most of these Fortune 1000 companies, sadly, has no clue what to do. And if he hasn't already felt this existential threat from the tech titans, he will very soon. Because he doesn't realize it, but his business is a tech business, it's a data business, and the odds of them building a solution for themselves, by themselves, basically zero. And 10 years ago, you could have said, yeah, this is gonna happen, this is the future, but the timing wasn't right. Why now is one of the first questions we like to ask as an investor. And the why now is all the things I just talked about. And now, he's really ready to show up <laughs> and say, yeah, I'll take the pitch from the 20-something with an initial prototype and something that, that works better because I know I need it, because I know my future share value depends on it, and I know this company can't build it itself. Now, I can't speak for how things are on the European continent, but I can say soundly, within the United States and North America and even East Asia, um, there is a real, real hunger for this. And so the opportunity is here, Startup Founders, and it's, it's that why now moment that's happening right now that's so powerful. And the thing that I hope we get right is this. Uh, I really believe that data is the new oil, and it is a resource that it turns out every one of us has underneath our feet figuratively speaking. Um, but it's one that we've not had control over. And it's one that I would argue that even in the United States, even the most, you know, uh, millennial, millennial, even the most Gen Z, Gen Z cares about. I do believe that we, even in the States, care about privacy. And I really do believe that we care about access to our data. And I think what we've seen in the last year has awakened people but it hasn't been a full transition. We haven't really seen the big impact of it yet, but we will. And I think there are two forces pushing on that. Obviously, GDPR here in Europe has started a really important conversation on this continent. I think it is gonna be a thing that American legislators are going to look towards. And I think that's part of the push that's gonna drive more of this. But I think there's also gonna be a pull for consumers. I think once we can build platforms that will let consumers seamlessly take control of this information and actually own it, and maybe even make money from it, if they want to have their data harvested and get paid for it, that they can opt into it and decide that they want to, so long as they know that they have some degree of anonymity and some degree of compensation for making that decision that they are aware of. And this today still feels very far afield from where we are. But I think actually this is an interesting potential intersection for blockchain and for AI and ML, because we can actually see a potential for a world where having decentralized information, encrypted, secure, anonymous, but still with access to the individuals who are creating it, who have their little pipeline of oil uh, underneath how they're using the web, 
I think once that process, once that software is built, once that infrastructure is built so that users, individuals, citizens can actually say that they really own it, I think we'll see a huge shift. I think we'll see a huge change because we'll have the control again and we'll actually be able to gain the value that we deserve to gain or we'll have the ability to turn the switch off and say, no, no, I, I don't actually want this shared. But it's gonna take more than just a push. It's actually gonna have to take a pull from consumers wanting something better. And for us as creators and investors and supporters of those people, um, it's up to us to, to be making those things or helping make those things. But I think this is, this is going to be a fundamental issue in the years to come. And I know, I, I know that there are people in this room right now who are working on solutions, who are thinking about this every day, and it's really important, frankly, um, because we need, we need David to win. I think any ecosystem that is a monoculture is going to have a problem. Any ecosystem that doesn't have a diversity of ideas and opinions and competition for product is going to suffer. And any ecosystem where people don't feel safe to share their lives is going to be a problem. And I think we're getting better. I think we're actually seeing progress but we're seeing it at the earliest stages. We're seeing it at startups that come pitch us with two or three founders and are still five years away from you ever knowing their names or using their services. But I'm, I'm imploring all of you, this is really a chance for Europe, for the European continent to lead the world. And one of the things that's impressed me the most in the last few years, and this is again going back to the decentralized nature of crypto, is so many amazing companies are being built that are much like the platform themselves, decentralized, um, spread all over the world. And I think when we think about the responsibility that comes from AI and ML, I think having that responsibility is going to be just as important. And I think the opportunities and the leadership that you all can do through creation, through actually building better slings, so to speak, for the Davids to be able to trump the Goliaths is what is ultimately gonna win the day. So I'm imploring you to do that. I would obviously love for you to pitch me about it too, but at the very least, go do it, create the success that we need, and then just tell me about it later on Twitter. I'd just really appreciate hearing that. Um, but thank you very much, Amsterdam. Thank you.